everyone. Hi, I'm Andy Smith, and I'm the coordinator for Evangelicals for Justice. Uh, we're one of the organizations, along with Voices, Freedom Road, and uh, Christians for Social Action, that are sponsoring the Beyond Christian Nationalism Week of Action. And this is one of the many exciting events that are happening in support of this week. I and mean, if you're interested in finding out more of the other act uh, actions and events happening, you can look at the website, um, um, lamentingchristiannationalism.org. Um, but today, this is an event sponsored by the Network of Evangelicals for the Middle East to discuss the topic, uh, how are Christian Zionism and Christian nationalism connected? Uh, what do we even mean by these terms? So we have an esteemed panel here that will kind of help explore uh, this in our uh, following discussion. I'll just briefly introduce people just for sake of time, um, but uh, speakers might say more about their work as, as they talk today in the discussion. So we have David Crump, who uh, taught for many years at Calvin College in Religion and is the author of the book, I Pledge Allegiance, A Believer's Guide to Kingdom Citizenship in 21st Century America. Then we have Dan Hawk, who teaches at Ashland Theological Seminary in Ashland, Ohio, and is the author of the books, The Violence of the Biblical God, Canonical Narratives in Christian Faith, and Joshua in 3D, A Commentary on Biblical Conquest and Manifest Destiny. And then also we have Lisa Sharon Harper, who is the founder and president of Freedom Road, and is also the author of many books, but most especially her award-winning book, The Very Good Gospel. And so to just get our discussion started today, um, if all of us can just maybe speak to the question, give some initial co uh, comments on, well, how, do you, how would you define Christian nationalism and Christian Zionism, and how do you see the two connected? Um, so let's start off with David. What are your thoughts? Sure, let me begin by uh, defining my understanding of nationalism. I would say that nationalism begins when uh, a group of people see themselves as being unified and as a collective through a shared history, ancestry, and a common mythology, which then directs them towards a future in a particular territory with a particular destiny that has oftentimes been determined by God. So they often view themselves as a chosen people, a chosen nation, which is going to have a manifest destiny. We would use the word exceptional destiny too, as they fulfill God's purposes for them in this world. Uh, Christian nationalism fits into that by defining the unique character of the people. It's often common for nationalist movements to talk about the national character, uh, the common identity that all of these people have in common that makes them united. Christian nationalism comes along and says that unique character uniting these people is Christianity, however that is defined. And as a result then, they're the chosen Christian people who are fulfilling God's purposes for the Christian faith in the world. And I think we've seen plenty of practical displays of that in the United States over the last several months. Did you want me to talk about Christian Zionism too, or just nationalism at first? Oh, no, Christian Zionism, and most importantly, how you see the two is connected okay. or not. <clears throat> well, of course, Christian Zionism uh, has long roots going back all the way to the Puritans, at least, with their idea of restorationism. And they understood themselves both after they immigrated to the United States, as well as when they were living in Great Britain, in England, as having a very unique role in helping to restore the Jewish people to the promised land. So even though their view of Zionism was not the same as what most Christian Zionists hold on to today, they were linked by that common aspiration. And as history unfolded, these groups saw both the United States and Great Britain as particularly chosen by God 
as the nations that would be used to facilitate the return of the Jewish people to the promised land. And Christian Zionism in the West in particular continues to maintain that kind of ideology today. Not only is it important that a collective body of national Jewish identity has been reestablished in the ancient land of Israel as they would define it, but it's equally important that the United States then continue to maintain its role of protecting, enhancing, helping, facilitating, including arming and supporting in its war machine, uh, whatever the state of Israel wants to do under the aegis of self-defense and protection. So that really explains the very, very close affinity between US foreign policy and the behavior of the state of Israel. Thank you so much. Um, Lisa, can you share your thoughts on how you see these um, concepts as being uh, connected? Sure. Thank you so much, Andy. And, and thank you so much to my esteemed colleagues here. I'm really excited to be in conversation with you. Um, I'm going to be very brief. I'm going to save most of my comments for our conversation. But I'll just say that Christian nationalism, when you look at nationalism at its, at its center, the center point is hierarchy of human belonging. That in, in a nationalist perspective, it is placing the one's nation as the center of the question of whether or not they are at the top of the human hierarchy of God's concern and also their own and their people's concern. So whether it is American nationalism or Iranian nationalism or Russian nationalism, if you are a nationalist in that country, then your fundamental belief is that your nation, the people within the citizens of your nation exist at the top of God's concern. Christian nationalism con condenses or, or blends that national nationalism with Christian identity as well. And you see that I think most explicitly in American churches where on Sunday morning, they'll, you'll come into the church and you'll see the American flag next to the Christian flag, right? Right, right, right on the other side of the pulpit. Um, people will, will sing my country tis of thee in church uh, around the 4th of July. Um, or Memorial Day, Labor Day. Um, there is, a, there is a, a, a strong reverence for country as in, and it comes, it comes in the same place as God and country, that, you know, that the whole uh, language of God and country. It, my first time confronting that belief system within my own mindset, because it's what I grew up with and didn't even realize that was there. And I was in a Methodist church, United Methodist Church down in Cape May, New Jersey, but when I went out to Los Angeles and I started going to um, LA First Church of the Nazarene, which is doing some very deep decolonizing work within itself, the pastor, Ron Benefield, who eventually became the president of Nazarene Theological Seminary, he did a series of talks on nationalism and how we are not actually, as the church, we are not for any one nation, we are for all nations. And so Christian nationalism is an aberration to God, it's an aberration to the scripture. Um, it's not nominal, it actually is, it is um, a declaration of war against the kingdom of God, or it's the conflation of the kingdom of God with your nation and your faith. And how does this intersect with Christian Zionism? I, I'll let the experts, I'm not really an expert on that, but I'll let the experts really speak to that, except to say that I read an amazing book that I have here called Holy War, in grad school. And this, um, it was in the middle of taking a class on political Islam. And this book, while I can't vouch for all of it, what it does actually give you is it gives you a really amazing history of Zionism in America and how that Zionism starting in the 1800s actually found its way to Israel and actually influenced the beginning of Jewish Zionism, um, which is really interesting. It didn't go the other way around. It started with fundamentalist Christians and moved to Jerusalem from there. And there's a whole machine, a religious machine in America that, um, that has an interest in bringing on Armageddon in order to get to that, that millennial era where, where Jesus is gonna reign um, for a thousand years on earth and there'll be a thousand years of peace. But that peace 
will be predicated in the mindset of those Christian Zionists and Christian nationalists uh, on America ruling everybody else and on white America ruling everyone else in particular, because only white America is imagined to be fully Christian. Thank you. And Dan, can you share your thoughts on the intersections of Christian Zionism and Christian nationalism? Sure. Thanks for uh, the invitation to be a part of this panel. This is such an important discussion. So um, <clears throat> I like to think of Christian nationalism as, as a particular strain of what we might generally call American civil religion. Uh, so nationalist movements appropriate available cultural resources to lend a sense of transcendence to the nation, to, to, to give people a sense that uh, this nation is something worth sacrificing for, something worth being a part of, something uh, in, in some sense worth fighting for. Uh, so American civil religion is, is a, a way of talking about that complex of rituals and myths and symbols by which uh, we encourage citizens to, uh, to show their devotion to the nation, what, what makes this nation distinctive. And the connection with, with uh, so the connection actually with Christian Zionism starts after the re revolution when the founding generation, the elites uh, are using Old Testament motifs and symbols to talk about and, and to unify these 13 fractious colonies that had a lot of, of uh, conflict between them. And, and the issue was how, you know, how could we unify these? So, so this, this kind of American civil religion becomes a way of unifying people, redirecting religious motifs that were prominent, uh, basically from the New England Puritans had pretty much permeated uh, through through the, the the colonies by by the 1700s, and so the elites pretty much took these up uh, and uh, used uh, redirected a lot of these Puritan uh, motifs. So uh, the Puritan idea of of election became the chosen. We became a chosen nation. Uh, you know, uh, our mission. Uh, is, is, is evangelization, but in a secular way, we are a beacon of democracy. Uh, so we are, we are the exemplars of what the ideal community, human community looks like. So, so in, in a sense, we Americans uh, think about and relate to our nation uh, very generically in, in, in ways that have all the marks of uh, religious devotion. So we have our own scriptures, the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, Bill of Rights. Uh, we have holy days. We sing national hymns. Uh, we, we have a creed, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, which we teach to our children. So all of these marks of, of religious devotion uh, really get reoriented toward uh, the nation. And they're, and they're generic. They're not intended to replace Christianity. Uh, they're, they're intended to, to be alongside of Christianity, which is why when you look at the founding documents and when they're talking about religion, they really don't mention Jesus Christ. They don't, there are very few references to Christian doctrine. It's all about uh, the language is God or providence or uh, divine outworking, this idea that we've been blessed and raised up as a nation for a particular purpose to spread liberty. Christian nationalism then, is, um, is a sectarian, I would see it as a sectarian form um, that is specifically Christian, specifically with the idea that this should be a Christian nation governed by Christian people with Christian values. Uh, and has, so it's much more sectarian, it has uh, much more, as Lisa, you pointed out, has much more of a, uh, uh, an investment in maintenance of white supremacy. Uh, and this particular strain that we're seeing now uh, really has its roots, I think, in uh, the, the revival and the revision of that Christian nationalist myth in, in the 1970s when uh, various evangelical groups were forming together to form a political bloc. And this Christian nationalism 
was taken up again as a unifying force to, um, to, to unite, provide a common genealogy for these various Christian political groups uh, at that point when evangelicalism was, was politicized. So what's the connection with Christian Zionism? Well, some have said Christianity, Protestant Christianity in particular in the United States has been Zion-centered from the beginning. Uh, we, from the Puritans who, who, who considered themselves to be the New Jerusalem, onward to uh, the, the 1800s, early, early 1900s, when there was a deep affinity, the idea that the United States is um, a new Israel or an English Israel. Uh, so we, we just have a deep, deep identification uh, in our culture with biblical Israel that then gets translated uh, it pretty, pretty facilely and pretty directly into um, uh, just a sense of, of identification with uh, the modern state of Israel. Can I just Thank piggyback, you so much. Off? Can I piggyback off this for a second? Yeah. I'm glad that both Sharon, Sharon and Lisa and Dan brought up the issue of white supremacy because Christian nationalism has always been very closely associated with white supremacy. And a number of recent studies that I've come across that continue to demonstrate that in America today. And that accounts for a lot of the anti-immigrant sentiments that we saw during the Bush era. Uh, Christian nationalism wants to police the borders and keep those borders very tight and to make sure that only the right people get inside. And it's best if those people are white for more, most Christian nationalists. Uh, I also wanted to, to add to, to Dan's excellent comments about civil religion. I think it's interesting to note that the first Western philosopher to really develop this concept of civil religion was uh, Rousseau, the French thinker, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And in his articulation of what he saw as the new idea of a nation state, he believed that the best way to hold such a collection of people together was by creating not a religious religion, but a civil religion. So you take the, the civil artifacts of a society, which Dan articulated there very well, and you use that to replace Christianity. And he was very explicit and very adamant about this. He said the only way that a successful nation state can survive was to eliminate the Roman Catholic Church. <clears throat> now, Roman Catholicism was really the only brand of Christianity that, that he knew how to handle there. So in effect, when he says you've got to eliminate Roman Catholicism, he really is saying you need to eliminate the Christian religion from a society and replace it with this civil religion. Why is that so? Well, the number one issue in his mind was that Christianity was an international multi-ethnic faith. Christianity encompassed whomsoever would believe, regardless of where you live or what race or ethnicity you were a part of. And he argued that people who think like that will never be cooperative for the nation state. So if you want to make it, the nation state survivable, you've got to get rid of this. Now, I'm sure that the vast majority of Christian nationalists who are out parading for this ideology today may not be aware of Rousseau's thinking, but the sentiment continues to come through very, very strongly. And they act as if they are all really very, very uh, fervent students of Rousseau when they advocate for Christian nationalism. Thank you. Um, first of all, for everyone listening in, if you have questions for the panelists, so please feel free to put them in the Q&A and chat and we'll integrate them into the discussion. And also panelists, um, if you have another thought and I didn't call on you, feel free to jump in at any, at any point. But when I'm hearing all what you're saying, I'm hearing some kind of terms like chosenness, nationalism, and there's kind of, kind of the assumption that we, like if, if you're chosen, that means nobody else has been chosen, right? <laughs> if it's your nation, that means there's no other nation. And, and I'm hearing even from Dave, there's kind of an assumption to support a nation is to support a nation state. 
right? And but there could be other models of nationhood that are based on inclusivity rather than exclusivity. So, um, kind of my question to you all is: Are there any biblical resources that could help us think these things through? Are there any principles or themes from the Bible that might present a different way of understanding belonging that doesn't necessarily have to be hierarchical? Um, maybe I can just start with Lisa, since I know you've spoken a lot about this in the very good gospel. Yeah, I was, I was going exactly right there. Thank you so much, Andy. Well, yes, I do believe there's, I mean, on the very first page of the Bible, we actually get exactly that, um, that rubric, that, that uh, guidance. And it's interesting, too, because it was written in the context of, um, of colonization, of one smaller nation being consumed, dominated by another, depending on who, it doesn't really matter who you think wrote that text, whether you think it was Moses, who was, whose people were dominated by Egypt, or if you think it was the, um, uh, the priests coming out of the Babylonian exile after 70 years of enslavement there and exile. Either way, they were dominated by a larger empire. And it's in that context that they decide to write down their creation story. And it's in that creation story at that moment where they are about, they're about to exit Jerusalem, they're about, or sorry, exit Babylon, um, cross over and, and um, move into the promised land. And if, if, it's, if it's Moses, and it's at that moment that they actually stop and say, all humanity is made in the image of God, not just the kings and queens, not just them, which would have been the norm at that time. The norm at that time would have been to declare the king or the ruler to be the one made in the image of God. Not all, not all humanity. But in this incredible moment, they decide to democratize power. And it's not only within their nation, it's everywhere because they say it's human. What it means to be human is to be made in the image of God. And they attach, in case you don't understand, this you know, it might be a little, little slow, they say, and let them have dominion. In other words, all humanity, what it means to be human is to be created with the call of God and the capacity, all things being equal, to exercise stewardship of the world that God just created co-stewardship with God. And so that, that's a radical, radical statement. And it's one that comes directly against any hierarchy of human belonging, including nationalism. Yeah, Lisa, I so appreciate you going back to the creation narratives, which are really key. I mean, that's, that's where we see God's, it seems to me, God's vision uh, for humanity. Uh, and I was thinking as you were you were talking about this, how, uh, you know, beginning with the creation narrative when human beings defy the creator and, and claim to decide for themselves what's good for creation, one of the first, uh, one of the first effects of that is a hierarchy of power. God tells the woman, you know, since you've done this, now your man will rule over you. There are no, there are no hierarchies like that. Uh, in, in those first two chapters of Genesis. But that, that starts, I think, a, a real counter thread that we see working all throughout uh, the Old Testament. So Israel's uh, writings, its experience it, are written within the context of empire uh, and always with an eye on what that means. And, and, but there's this, there's this curious counter thread that in, in the Old Testament that particularly in the narratives that wants to pull back uh, from this idea that empire is the way things are and, and have been and evermore shall be and, and to, to, to uh, su just give a different picture that pulls us back to Eden. So I would argue that the Bible is fundamentally concerned with issues of uh, how race and ethnicity uh, as social class and gender are constructed because those are the primary hierarchies by which human beings divide themselves and, and seek to dominate. So, so this, this original mandate to take dominion, uh, when, when human beings de decide to, to make the world in their own image, 
we we turn from taking dominion over creation to trying to take dominion over ourselves. And so we've got these stories threaded through the Old Testament. Uh, right at the beginning, for example, of, of Abraham's story, we have the story of, of Hagar, his, his slave, whose story is told beyond her connection to Abraham and Sarah, as if her story is worth telling in its own right. She's introduced as an Egyptian slave woman who has a name. We have Ruth, uh, again, similarly described. Rahab, there, there are just lots of these stories, but, but they're, they're counter narratives. They're, they're, uh, they're pushing up against some of the, the, the larger uh, culturally infused narratives that, that, that in a sense want to, uh, to take a nod to the, to the fact that uh, you know, they, these, the, these constructions are the way things are and, and we should just go with them. And you, you just see this constant prodding in the biblical witness all the way into the New Testament. I, I uh, think one of the, I'm sorry, 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 Dan. Oh, no, <laughs> I think one of the things that is most fascinating that honestly, I literally had a moment where I wept when I was studying and uh, re doing research for the very good gospel. And actually that, uh, that chapter where I talk specifically about this, about this first page, when I realized the entire book, the entire of all of the books, <clears throat> there's not one book in the entire Bible that was written from the perspective of empire. Even David and Solomon were kings of a dinky little kingdom that kept getting sacked. It was not an empire. And they were always moving in the direction of pushing against the empires that were trying to colonize them. So even Jesus, Brown Jesus, Brown Mary, Brown Joseph, they were literally brown people colonized by a white supremacist Rome. And when you understand that, you understand the scripture in that, all of it in that context. Now, of course, all of it wasn't in the context of racialized hierarchy. We do get that though, when we start going into the Greek philosophers, that's, that's who began to divide us down by race. And uh, Aristotle coined the term Western supremacy and understood humanity to be a full human is a white person, a man who is able-bodied. So it's in that context that we meet Brown Jesus and that he's pushing. So I agree with you, Dan. I agree that I think, I think that the whole of the scripture is actually a push. Um, the story of a people, a, co a serially colonized, serially enslaved people pushing against the kingdoms of men and the kingdom of God pushing into time and space in order to save the image of God on earth. So then what, what do we do as Americans? Oh, Daniel. Yeah. Oh, Daniel, can I just follow up with that question? Oh, sure. yeah. I have just a follow up specifically in relationship to what both with you are saying is how, how would we look at the, this in terms of the founding of Israel in particular, right? You've written about um, conquest narratives and it seems like the tricky part of that is that they're often done in the name of liberation, right? It's an oppressed group seeking liberation, but then it becomes liberation at all costs, um, even once you've gained power. So in your kind of study of the Old Testament, are there any counterpoints to that project specifically? In other words, uh, when you, the U.S. was founded, people saw themselves as a new Israel, but why did becoming the new Israel lead to manifest destiny? Could there have been a different conceptualization of Israel based on what we see in the Bible that could have led to a different result? That's good. Yeah, well, that, that, those, those are a couple of great questions. Uh, so let me go with the first first. So we have the book of Joshua, which is Israel's foundation narrative. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to understand that the critique of that imperial conquest mode actually begins in the book of Joshua. So the book of Joshua actually is a multivocal book. There are, there are different story, there are different voices weighing in. So you've got the, you've got this, uh, what we might today call a nationalist uh, voice that says, yep, God, God gave us this land, God fought for us. We were a completely obedient to God, we erased the land of the indigenous people, 
And uh, we settled there in the place. And, and uh, so this land belongs to us. But there's another, again, there's another counter narrative within the book of Joshua itself. So before the first three battles, we, we actually have accounts of interpersonal encounters Ooh. with Canaan. So there's, there's the, the very first uh, story of Israel's entrance into the land. They meet a Canaanite prostitute, a woman, uh, who, if you read the story, it's, it's just remarkable. She looks more Israelite than, than the spies. The spies don't have a name. She has an identity. She has a name. She exhibits all the, the, the traits of, of what Israel prizes. So there, there's a lot going on there that I can only hint at at this particular point that, that does tell us that Israel uh, was, was seeing and grappling with its own traditions of conquest and all of the implications of that and moving in a different way, uh, moving away from that as, as a norm. Um, you know, could it have been different uh, in, in, the, in the United States? Sure, but, but you have, we got started on, 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 on a, 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 you know, a, an unfortunate footing. So you have the, 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 the Puritans who come to New England with a strong sense of, of uh, a mission to, to, to establish a, a Christian Israel. Uh, so they're, they're going, to, they're going to, to establish God's people and it's gonna be Christian this time. They're gonna follow the, the Old Testament. So they, they make a passage through the sea. They think typologically when they read the Bible, the Bible is talking to us and who we are and how we understand it. So we made a passage from the, through the sea uh, uh, and, and, and were saved from tyranny and we entered into a new promised land. And uh, it's, it's something that God has given to us. And, and it's also populated by uh, uh, these indigenous people who uh, don't uh, worship God. So if you're, if you're reading typologically, uh, you know, there's something that presses you to uh, an idea of what you should do with these indigenous people, how you should relate to them, who they are. Um, and that leads, unfortunately, I think, to, to uh, uh, eventually kind of this violence uh, and this, this, this sanctioning of violence and expansion and conquest of indigenous peoples uh, throughout the 19th century and, and, and then on into the 20th. I want to say, I realized that David hasn't spoken. Oh, just, um, Lisa, yeah, I was just about to say, David, um, and also David, a question has come up, if you might be able to integrate into your comments. Um, people are asking, well, why are Christians so invested in this that they don't see any dangers to that, to their own faith? Okay, okay, I'll try to keep that in mind too. Mm -hmm. uh, I think another important concept here that I would add to this very good and important conversation is the notion of the covenant. Uh, I, I do take at face value the Old Testament presentation of Israel as a peculiar, unique people, eventually a nation, although I wouldn't call it a modern nation state in any sense of the term, but they were brought into a unique covenantal relationship with their creator. And that is the heart of what eggheads like me call salvation history. You know, the unfolding of God's plan for working out his salvation in the world beginning with this one character, Abraham, continuing on through the people of Israel, coming then eventually to the birth of Jesus of Nazareth and blossoming beyond the resurrection and ascension into the New Testament church. That, that is appropriated, I would say, very, very illegitimately uh, by just at large people who want to make some kind of nationalistic use out of religion. Um, so as Daniel was pointing out, they looked for the typologies, the corollaries between the story of Israel and the story of their own people group. And they say, look, we are now recapitulating. We're reliving the experience of Israel 
So we must be the new covenant people. And that really is the root that needs to be cut away at the heart of all of these nationalistic religious storylines. Just about every country that has any kind of Christian heritage has fallen into this trap at one time or another. There was even a folklorist uh, in Denmark who once wrote that Denmark was the new Israel, you know, and, and it was gonna be the center of the universe some way by doing all of this. Everybody has done it. I just finished reading a brand new book out on race relations in America. And their whole thesis was that the only way we can save uh, the United States from a new race war is to reconstitute the idea of the American national covenant with God. All of this is, again, another underhanded way to try to perpetuate a nationalistic religious approach to these problems, which will fail at the end of the day. And my basic theological reason for saying that will fail is by simply observing that when you look at scripture, no person ever comes up to God and says, I'm going to be in a covenant relationship with you. It's always the other way around. It's God who decides, I am going to establish a covenant with Israel. And then God decides how that process unfolds. And guess what? God ain't never come to the United States or Denmark or England or anybody else and said, hey, I'm going to make you my covenant people. It's never happened. It never will happen. Maybe in the, I'm sure before we're done, we're going to talk about the transition from the old covenant into the new covenant period with Jesus as the transition point. But the continuation of covenant promises happens in Jesus Christ. And the fulfillment of those promises happen in the people who love and serve and follow Jesus Christ. So covenant is another concept that is being seriously abused and misused in these conversations about Christian nationalism wherever they might be happening. Because underlying that is a misappropriation of the covenant language that has no reference whatsoever to any particular nation state any longer, and nor will it ever again. Now, having rambled on, I forgot the question you asked me. <laughs> what am I supposed so, to say? <laughs> how, how uh, the, kind of the question is, how, how is it that Christians get, get so invested in this kind of Christian nationalist project without any concern about the dangers that would present to their own faith, right? Where essentially yeah. the U.S. flag becomes a thing to follow rather than Jesus. Right, right. Well, before I was a professor, I was a preacher. And a one-word answer for that question would simply be sin. <laughs> it, it really comes down to that, that it's a wickedness in the human heart that then exemplifies itself in a variety of different ways. One of those ways is, you know, Paul has to remind the Corinthians in the book of 2 Corinthians that they need to keep their focus on the things that are unseen, not the things that are seen. Because the things that are unseen are eternal. But the things that are seen are only temporal and passing away. And that is a constant struggle in every individual Christian's life. We've got to remember that this world is not our final home or destination, and yet we are bombarded daily by images and practices and habits and messages that want to draw our attention and focus to the things that are seen in the here and now. And we forget the proper orientation for citizenship in the kingdom of God. So things like the flag and material goods and patriotism and all the rest of that very easily supplant the fact that we worship an invisible God who we've never seen, a resurrected, ascended Christ that we've never seen, who promises us eternal benefits that we have yet to see. 
And we're very easily waylaid by that. The second, second thing I'd say, I think it, it comes down to a colossal failure of Christian leadership. And among all the different lessons that we have to learn from these last four years of Donald Trump, for me as a churchman, I think that is one of the predominant lessons we need to take away from this. The only way that 80-something percent of white evangelicals could have voted for a man like that is because of the failure of proper biblical teaching, instruction, and leadership in the Christian church. We've taken our eyes off of Jesus, and there have not been about enough men and women like Dan and Lisa here. I wish we could multiply them a million fold. We need more to stand up and say, if you are a citizen in the kingdom of God, we are called to live like Jesus, to be people like Jesus, who serve and sacrifice and suffer like Jesus. And that allows no room for any kind of nationalist propaganda. I mean, if we were focused on being like Jesus, we would be able to identify the counterfeit of this nationalism and set it aside for the garbage that it is. I could go on, but those are, I think, are really the key issues that I would identify in answer to that question. Thank you so much. And Lisa, I had a kind of a follow-up question uh, from your thoughts. Um, when you were talking about, we have to remember the Bible is being not written from the perspective of empire. But I'm thinking of Robert Warrior's essay, Canaanites, Cowboys, and Indians, and what she critiques kind of the investment in the Exodus model, which is to say, that when an oppressed group gets so invested in its survival and then one day achieves power, it still operates as if it's being oppressed. And we certainly see that, I think, amongst evangelicals today, always describing themselves as persecuted. In fact, I read one study that said something like 80% of white evangelicals think uh, white evangelicals are very oppressed, but only think only 20% think black Christians are oppressed. Right, so they see themselves as oppressed. They don't see themselves as from the position of empire. So, kind of my question is, and and also I think um, from what Dan Dan and David were saying, um, because there is no official covenant with the U.S., the way you get the covenant is by attaching yourself to the covenant with Israel. Right, like that's the original covenant that allows um, that comes from a position of colonization that allows your investment and conquest from now on because you're just carrying on the, the covenant with Israel. So given that, what is a different way we can think of liberation that doesn't lead to these kinds of traps? Mm, that's a great question. Well, I, I actually, in the last book, that, well, the second to last book that I wrote, um, co-wrote with Soon Chan, Dr. Soon Chan Ra, Dr. May Cannon, and, and Troy Jackson, Dr. Troy Jackson, uh, called Forgive Us, uh, Confessions of a Compromised Faith. I wrote the section on the indigenous experience in America's sin against indigenous community in America and traced it back to, and I'm sure it goes back beyond this, but certainly this is the point that we focused on Jonathan Withrop and his city on a hill and that covenant that he said that those original uh, pilgrims had with, uh, with, with God, that if they lived according to the call of God in the same way that God called the Israelites to live um, in Canaan, then God would make them prosper and it would all be good. And if not, then they would be, you know, sinners in the hands of an angry God, basically, although that came later, right? So, but what he, what he failed to do, even if you understand that that is the rubric that God is working with, he failed to live up to that because it was Jonathan Winthrop's idea to do the Pequot massacre. Pequot massacre was his idea, right? That's not, that's not of God. Um, and it's certainly not honoring of the image of God in the other. But I, I actually questioned in that same book, why did the pilgrims place themselves in that story at all? Why they could have seen the Pequots as the ones 
who God promised the land to. And the pilgrims are not in the story at all. They're not just not even, it's not their story. I think that, I think that we, have, we have been approaching the Exodus and the Canaan story through the lens of white Europeans and then uh, naming the text itself as problematic without understanding that actually it's the lens that's problematic. It's the lens, it's the approach of white Westerners who approach that text, placing themselves in the text when they are not there. Um, and therefore by doing that, giving themselves theological cover, existential cover to do whatever. So I would argue that, uh, that I actually believe that, and I, I think this is pretty, just by, by way of the, knowing the history we know, the DNA science that we know, we know that creator led indigenous peoples to come uh, into, onto this land and to live here and to exercise dominion here. We know this happened because they were here first. And so the question, I think David, I can hear your, I think your, <laughs> one of your pieces is, is uh, going, but uh, the question is not one of whether or not God calls um, uh, the Jews or the Puritans to massacre the indigenous people. The question is, why is that in the text? What is, what's, what's, the, what's the learning point there? Is this something God actually wanted? Was this a misread of the actual text? Uh, in the garden is, I will follow you. There's, there's, there's a David Crump. <laughs> that is, uh, okay, it's okay, muted, there you go. So is this a misread of the text? I was speaking with Ruth, um, with Ruby Sales, Dr. Ruby Sales about this, and she actually believes it's a misread of the text, that, or it's a misread of God, that God, what if that text is actually a cautionary tale versus uh, a tale of what, what should be? Thank you. Uh, I think we're starting to get closer to the end, and uh, so many of the questions are, what what does all this tell us about today? Um, so kind of synthesizing some of the participant comments. Um, uh, when we think of kind of Christian nationalism, a current event, we think of it was the insurrection, right? Um, we think of um, now what's going on in Israel and Palestine. And at a previous event, someone said, why is it that um, whatever Israel does in its defense is considered self-defense, but whatever Palestine does in its own interest is considered terrorism. So kind of in light of these, these critical events happening right now, um, what does the Bible or what does our faith or is there any way we can kind of reconceptualize how we can understand what's happening now and what should be the Christian and evangelical response to, to these events? Anyone would like to start? David, I think you're muted. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll start. I, Go ahead. Oh. <laughs> I've on. often had people who wanted to mute me before, but I've never mm -hmm. seen such success. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Usually I'm unmutable. Not immutable, <laughs> but unmutable. Uh, well, let me add another kink to the equation of nationalism here and add the idea of ethnic nationalism. Uh, which we have been talking about, but without labeling it as such. That's really what's going on in Israel. And that's the kind of nationalism that Christian Zionists in the West are supporting when they endorse Israel. Uh, I won't go into it all here. I've written about it fairly extensively in a forthcoming book that I have that should be out by before the, I'm hoping by the end of the summer, maybe. It's going to be called like birds in a cage, which talks about uh, this, this, the colonialism of Israel and its continuing expression uh, in oppressing Palestinians today. And the state of Israel uh, is an expression of ethnic nationalism that arose out of Europe 
particularly in the 17th and 18th centuries, or rather 18th and 19th centuries, I'm sorry, which prioritizes, as Lisa was saying earlier, one particular group. It's a state that believes in Jewish supremacy. And because of its belief in Jewish supremacy, eliminating Palestinians is perfectly permissible. And we see that happening in Sheikh Jarrah, uh, on the Temple Mount, and with the bombing of Gaza. You're absolutely right. Israel can do whatever it wants because they are the ethnically uh, supreme people. And Palestinian suffering does not matter because they're the indigenous people who have gotten in the way. And I think a large part of the reason why so many in the United States, but particularly Christian Zionists in the United States are willing to go along with that is because of two reasons, one cultural, the other spiritual. On the cultural level, Americans still see themselves very much as a pioneering people. And the idea of Western expansion and Western conquest uh, is very much a part of American mythology. And though it's being eaten away slowly with time, uh, we all know that very much at the heart of that is the elimination of the native. So even though I'm not sure many people bring that up consciously, at more of a subconscious subliminal level, this story makes sense to them. It is the story of the expansion of civilization. It is what happens when good things unfold in the Western narrative. So they look at what's going on in the state of Israel, and it's as if we're looking in a mirror. We're seeing ourselves, and we know that we are great. Therefore, we assume that what's going to be happening in Israel is also going to turn out great, and we can turn our backs upon the suffering of the Palestinian people. The second ingredient here, the spiritual component, I'll get back to once more, which I frankly cannot fathom as much as I've thought about it. I just can't wrap my mind around it, is the complete absence of any kind of Christian conscience when it comes to looking at this suffering. I am, I am adamantly opposed to Christian Zionism, but let's just say what if, as a thought experience, experiment. What if it were true? Let's just allow it. Even if it were true, is there anything here that still can condone the slaughter that goes on whenever an Israeli military unit encounters a bunch of Palestinians? Can we accept their third-class citizenship? Can we accept them living in the largest open-air prison in the world? Can we accept their daily military occupation? Can we accept them being stripped of all human rights, all civil liberties? Can we accept that as people of conscience? I don't see how. <laughs> and yet somehow or another, Christian Zionist ideology works in such a way that it flips a switch on people and their moral sensibilities completely shut down when it comes to this particular issue. And that, again, I think is a grave spiritual problem that once more reflects a failure of leadership and a failure of uh, discipleship within the Christian community in this country. Thank you so much, um, Dan or Alicia, did you have thoughts? Yeah, let, let me, I'd like to take this in just a, a different direction, if I may. Uh, one of the things I want to suggest is that uh, we, we need to press against the, the biblical hermeneutic that supports all of this. And what I'm thinking about specifically is this tendency, particularly on the part of modern evangelicals, to continue to read typologically. Um, so you know, this, uh, this idea that the state of Israel is, is a, a manifestation, a, a sign of the end times, uh, and that God's promises to Abraham still apply, and uh, those who bless Israel will be blessed, those who uh, curse Israel will be cursed, and so on and so forth. So this, this whole idea that um, 
you know, we're, we're, we're reading the Bible in a typological sense within this millenarian framework it really, really has to be pressed against um, in a way that, that helps and guides uh, Christians to really see the big picture of scripture, which is God's relentless and resolute determination uh, to, to bring peace and justice to all of the peoples of the world, uh, to unite all peoples, uh, in, and, and simply to, to seek the human flourishing for all peoples and not just for, for those at, at the top. Um, so the, I, I, I don't know that people realize how pervasive some of this is, uh, even today. So um, on, on, in, the, in the charismatic, uh, a portion of, of, of evangelicalism, we have a whole panoply of Christian prophets who are reading scripture typologically and then making prophetic pronouncements. And these people on YouTube uh, are getting hundreds of thousands, even millions of views. Jonathan Kahn, one of the, uh, one of the real influential voices, uh, just had a, had a best-selling series uh, called the Harbinger and and, and books uh, had a had a huge rally in September uh, during the High Holy Days. Jonathan Kahn is a Messianic rabbi, and uh, we had blowing shofars. We had uh, uh, kind of Jeremiads against uh, you, you know the the nation which was going to stand under judgment. We had this idea that Trump is is a modern day Cyrus. Who is, uh, you know, uh, called by God uh, to release people and to bring us back? And now, and now we're seeing from a lot of these same prophets uh, who are are still trying to deal with the fact that that, that their prophecies didn't go, <laughs> the events didn't go according to script. Um, but now what we're hearing is uh, that uh, you know, Donald Trump was actually supposed to be a Jehu. And he was supposed to overthrow the Jezebel spirit that, that took our nation captive when the Clintons were in the White House and Hillary Clinton, by virtue of her uh, advocacy abortion rights, was, is a Jezebel. Uh, and so there's, there's all of this strange, just weird pronouncements based on scripture. And so now, You've got the Jezebel language being re-invoked, but now with reference to Kamala Harris, uh, who is continuing that Jezebel spirit because she, as well as Hillary Clinton, is advocating for abortion rights. She's a liberal, so on and so forth. So this whole millenarian idea that there's this, we're part of a cosmic battle between good and evil. We're the good, we need to stay on the good side. We need to defend what God is doing, and, and, the, and the Bible confirms that in this and this and this and this and this way, uh, it just has to be taken on uh, forthrightly. And we're starting to run out of time, but Lisa, would you like to kind of offer any of your thoughts on what to do in the present moment with all these shenanigans going on from a biblical perspective? Thank you, Andy. Wow. I, I actually, it's funny because I had a thought about five minutes ago and I don't remember what it was now. <laughs> I, I think that, um, first of all, I just want to say to both David and Dan, um, thank you so much for, for the richness of your commentary. Um, I think the only thing I would add is just to say that, you know, thinking about the Jezebel spirit, and the way that Jezebel is now being invoked, that's not a new thing. And it what certainly didn't start with Hillary Clinton. And people, women of African descent have been called Jezebels for a very long time. Um, and it is another example of the racialization of right and wrong, of, of um, darkness and light. Um, and uh, the conceptualization of the self being well because one is white, um, pure as snow. And uh, in fact, it probably has deep connection, does have deep connection into the purity movement as well. Um, so a lot of people who think of the white nationalist 
our white Christian nationalist agenda and movement as being something out there really need to take a look inside and in their own churches because it's so deeply permeated almost every facet and every level, every stream of the white evangelical church. Um, it's in the, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and so I would say that uh, when looking at Israel and what's happening now, the most fundamental thing that I think is important is that we have to understand that we're talking about two deeply oppressed people groups. Um, we're talking about uh, the Palestinians who right now are suffering under the barrage of bombs and, uh, and military force that is literally aiming to crush, aiming to, as one person put it on the evening news, ethnic cleansing, to cleanse whole communities of Palestinians. That is the goal of um, some of the work that is uh, military forces being leveled right now. And those who are doing that work, doing that, and I don't mean to call it work as in a nominal thing, but doing that, those actions, are doing them thinking of themselves as the perpetual victim, much like others have mentioned before, as the ones who are perpetually having to save their lives and, and, uh, and the nation of Israel exists to do that because of actual history where they actually were exterminated. There's a psychological phenomenon um, that is named in the book, um, doers beyond the doers and done to, um, beyond doers and done to. And this is a book written by a, a Jewish psychologist out of UCLA who himself, he's actually been um, uh, signaling to the Jewish community, there is a better way. We do not have to, we do not have to blind ourselves to our own actions in order for us to be safe. We can and must, as Jewish people, he says, see what we are doing and correct for it. Um, and I, I, I would just add that it is, what that is a testimony to is the reality that all humanity is not only made in the image of God and called to exercise dominion, but all humanity has the capacity to dominate as well, given the, pos given the power to do so. So the call here is for us to choose the beloved community and to call our nation in the United States, since that's where most of us are located, and wherever you are located in the world, if you're watching, to call our nations, to call for the beloved community. Um, and as, as complicated and as real as it will be, it needs to start now. Now is the time, now is the window for us to call for a solution um, to the carnage that has been happening in the Middle East. Well, thank you so much, Alisa, for those wonderful words to kind of end us with. And I welcome everyone to can stay connected with NEMI and it's a space for evangelicals who are thinking, you know, beyond these binaries, beyond a zero sum game, but how can we have a world in which all nations are respected and cared for in which all peoples can be saved. Um, also, uh, you might wanna join Lisa in an hour <laughs> for our Beyond Christian Nationalism Twitter hour. I uh, can follow us at Beyond Christian Nationalism. And as mentioned in the chat, there's going to be another event by NEMI on, from uh, uh, Ferguson to Palestine. So check out the Lamenting Christian Nationalism uh, website and uh, as well as stay connected with all the groups uh, happening today. So this is a conversation, but it's going to be a continuing conversation as we talk to people and say, is there a different way we can imagine the world um, in which we can all be free? Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.